So as the title suggests, there'll be a talk about bounds for standard L functions. So we should first remind ourselves what are standard L functions. So yeah, for the purpose of this talk, an L function will always be uh, a function of a complex variable defined by an order, an order product. So I'll write an example of order product here. All right, I'm still remembering how blackboards feel. So let's see how this goes. All right, and you guys can read this, right? So it's a product of um, n factors for each prime, each of which looks something like what shows up in the zeta function, but involving some complex coefficients that are typically non-zero. And um, okay, so anything that one calls an L function looks like this. The ones that we'll refer to by the adjective standard in this doc will be attached to automorphic forms or more precisely automorphic representations, pi, on the general linear group over the rational numbers. Uh, and we'll always take pi to be custodial and we'll normalize it to be unitary. That'll be very convenient. There's not much less a loss of generality in these assumptions. So we'll recall the functional equation of these things, which gives us a good chance to introduce some notation. So the, it's expressed most simply in terms of some, what's sometimes called the completed L function lambda, um, which is defined by multiplying L by some normalized gamma factors, shifted by some complex numbers that I'll call lambda one through lambda n, referred to maybe as the Archimedean parameters of the L function. So there'll be some n-tuple of complex numbers that'll kind of be the main invariance to pay attention to in this talk. And then we get the L function here. So with this notation, the functional equation can be expressed uh, quite simply and symmetrically as follows. So we'll get um, a number that I'll call epsilon pi. This will be something of absolute value one, the way we've normalized things. There will be some, some natural number called, called the finite conductor that I'll denote by C finite raised to the half minus S. And then we get back the same thing, but with I replaced by the dual object. Just what you get by conjugating the coefficients of pi with unitary normalization. Okay. Okay, now we're interested in uh, the following numbers. So L of one half plus IT for pi. Yeah, gamma R is the standard line, right? Pi, yeah, gamma of R is, is what shows up in the functional equation for zeta. So I'll write it here. Just a, a mild tweaking of gamma of S over two. So for instance, you can take the zeta function and ask how it behaves on the uh, vertical contour uh, formed by the center of symmetry of the functional equation. And there's a standard trick. Um, I guess sometimes you want to consider not just variation in t for this expression, but also variation in pi. So you might take a Dirichlet L function and allow both the conductor of the Dirichlet character and the parameter t to vary. And there's a standard more or less notational trick for consolidating your notation a bit and reducing it to the case when t is zero which is you replace pi with this twist by the determinant of the IT. And that's, that's another object that satisfies these same assumptions. So we can always kind of reduce to the case t equals zero and reduce the, and thereby reduce the number of variables we have to pay attention to. And, and this, this kind of twisting has the effect of shifting these end parameters by an additive term IT. So it affects everything in sight in a very predictable way. So from now on, we'll pay attention to just the numbers L of pi one half. And the kind of bound that we and other people will be interested or have been interested in proving for these things is normalized as follows. So we ask for a bound in terms of the finite conductor, as well as what I'll call the Archimedean conductor, C infinity, which is what you get basically by multiplying together the sizes of these numbers, lambda one through lambda n. Product normalized in such a way that it's never very small if just one of them is small. Uh, 
And yeah, you multiply these two numbers together, together, you get what's called the analytic conductor. And you ask for a bound in terms of powers of that, where um, maybe the implied constant here you let depend upon n, the degree of the L function, and this little safety valve epsilon. So the question that arises, what is the smallest value you can take here for beta? Or what is the infimum of those values? The equations, uh, the middle equations with the half, it's, it's true for, for any other number or just for half? Uh, it's true just for a half. Uh, what? It's true just for a half. Just for a half. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's saying you can take the IT and move it over here. It's basically a feature of the definition. Uh, only, exactly. only, only for one over two, for half. It's not true if you're uh, reducing it to that. You could change that so, half on both so, sides. Yeah, you could do this. You could do well, one half plus. If, like, if you put. You, you, can, you can replace one half. One by, third in, in both sides, then it's still correct. Yeah, then it's still correct. Absolutely. So why are you so interested in now? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So um, the problem of bounding these things, if you just want any non trivial bound, you can always reduce that to the case of the parameter one half using standard kind of complex analytic techniques involving the functional equation. So it's, really, uh, so it's kind of the fundamental thing. And yeah, I've kind of swept that under the carpet, but um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, if you prove a non-trivial bound at any other number between zero and one, you will get one at one half. Um, yeah. And, and I, mean, I mean, this one is also the one where you can kind of most crisply state the sharpest bound that you expect. So, So the um, yeah the, sh the sharpest thing that we expect is what's called the Lindelof hypothesis, which says that you can take a to be zero, and by contrast, there's something called the convexity bound, which um, I guess in this generality is a theorem is a theorem of Ivanovich and Molteni, which says that you can take beta most important. And so this is, um, yeah, so the problem arises of improving this by any positive quantity. That's called the subconvexity problem. And it's, it's solved now for n equal one or two, not for any larger value of n. And um, so, so we certainly won't solve it today, but we'll improve upon this bound in some cases. So roughly speaking, we'll focus on the case when the finite conductor is more or less fixed, maybe take it to be one. In fact, we will take it to be one for the discussion of the proof. And furthermore, assume that these numbers lambda one through lambda n are roughly of the same size. And under these two assumptions, we'll, we'll state a, an improvement on this bound. So, I mean. Can I the wrong limit of conjecture? Sorry, say again? That's, that's with the Molteni. Do you need to assume this R ah. or unity or something like that? So if you assume that, then this is not a non-trivial theorem. It's easy. Without assuming it, it's the theorem that I mentioned of Ivanovich and Molteni. They prove that you can make the Euler product converge uniformly enough to. Yeah. Any other questions about setup while we're? So this one over four is unconditional result. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is. I'll just write your names. Um, Ivani, it's early 90s for GL2, and then Molteni, I think early 2000s for. Okay, so we'll prove the following. Um, so the preprint, you can read, it's on the archive as of last Friday, I think. And I don't have enough room to say, say, say it here. So, like I said, we'll impose an assumption. We'll assume that there exists some number that I'll call t. It'll come up throughout the talk. You should think of it as tending off to infinity, such that maybe t divided by, I don't know, should we do 100, 2021? Well, okay. Whatever your favorite number is, should bound from below the lambda j, while t should bound from above the lambda j in magnitude. Uh, for all the parameters j. So this rules out cases like when one of them is zero. That's the sort of content of the assumption. So then I'll just write the conclusion. 
So we'll get a bound that depends only upon the degree. And it'll look like the Archimedean conductor to the quarter minus delta. And I said we should think of the finite conductor as being fixed or maybe one, but I mean, we'll give something kind of explicit here just to, because it comes out of the proof. And um, so the main point here is that delta is positive and B is, let's say, finite. Um, but we get, we get reasonable enough values for these. So delta you can take to be, for example, one over 12 and to the fifth. And B you can take to be one half. It's actually like kind of amusingly close to a quarter, um, but uh, <laughs> that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. That's a little bit of a nice question. You're bound for lambda j. Can you actually stretch it to small powers of t around one, or is this actually important? So what would kind of follow by continuity from the proof? So, so actually, what you could probably do is you could prove it without this assumption, but replacing c infinity by t to the n, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. And then, the, and then the bound kind of is only non-trivial when something like this assumption is, is valid. Yeah. So a typical consequence of this would be this, this T aspect question that I mentioned above here, where you fix pi and you vary T. So you get that L of pi half plus I T is bounded in a manner only depending upon pi by um, something slightly smaller than the trivial bound. So let's say N times order minus delta. I hope I'm not writing too small for the people online here. It's getting a little, well, um, I'll try to write bigger than this for now, but maybe you can guess what the statement says from the context. Okay, so this, um, yeah, so, so, so if you wanna kind of, uh, one way to think of this is the, the standard L functions are kind of fundamental in the theory because at least if you believe the Langlands philosophy, they generate, um, all L functions. So you can write any L function as a product of these things. So you assume that that, that expectation, then this gives at least a T aspect bound for, for all of those um, and unconditionally for the, the standard ones. Okay. So any questions on what we're, what we're doing? Okay. So I'll try to say something about, I mean, I'll have to give an extremely abbreviated overview of history on uh, these kinds of things. So, so for instance, Vial and Hardy Littlewood, well, I guess Vial in 1916 and Hardy Littlewood earlier this year in 1921, so just over 100 years ago, did this for the zeta function. Um, and then many people have kind of improved it since then. Um, for n equal to, I'll just mention that uh, Anton Good established a non trivial bound in 1982, so in the holomorphic case. And then Murmon extended the Moss case. Peter gave kind of a uniform treatment of the shifted convolution problem that underlies it. And then the whole thing, the whole theory blew up in the late 80s with Duke Ivanich and company, especially in the Q aspect where it was found that it connected to sums of squares, quantum chaos, all these things that um, we don't really go into here. But um, so that generated a lot of interest. And I think that interest probably, at least in part, motivated the attempt to understand it just as kind of a pure problem in the same sense that Hardy Littlewood did uh, when, when it is a bigger number than two. And I guess the first result in that direction was a paper of Lee that appeared in 2011, um, giving something like this corollary for GL3 under a self-duality assumption, and then Munchi in 2015 without the self-duality assumption. Um, and then I guess in the generality of theorem one, there is paper of Blomer and Kim, which was published last year, which um, gave something kind of in the spirit under the additional assumption that the lambda j are not only of the same size, but all kind of spaced out. So that was um, what they treated. So when S3, I guess most of the content of the theorem is known. There are a couple of edge cases that hadn't been considered, like parameters look like TT and negative 2T. That's better filled in now. And I, and I guess also, I mean, I like that it kind of unifies 
the T aspect and the general well spaced aspect and kind of the, it gives a uniform proof of all of these, whereas um, if you stared at these proofs, you, you, you cannot at least superficially uh, interpolate between them. So the thing you really can't touch on your three is T zero minus T. Yeah, exactly. That's the, uh, the best problem right now. Yeah, so that's the, uh, that's, the that's, that's kind of the simplest one that's left by far. Um, or I mean, to do, to do, to do for any GLN, any case where you have one of the things zero, other than when is, N is two. For N is two, that's, that's understood. And, and I'll remark that when N is two, the proof that was eventually found use the kind of generic case that I've treated here as an input in the proof. So if you want to be very optimistic, you could hope that maybe this could even be used someday to understand that case. We won't speculate needlessly. Okay, and then, um, yeah, I'll just, I won't write it, but I'll mention that like, for example, sound in 2010 proved a logarithmic savings in the setting of that corollary unconditionally. And then sound in Foreigner, I guess in 2019, proved a logarithmic savings in kind of generality. And um, maybe the closest result to theorem one that you can find is for the groups un plus one times un. So I have an archive preprint um, from last year that addresses rankin solberg L functions here, whose basically whose functorial lip satisfies the assumptions of this theorem one. So the rankin solberg parameter should all be big. And under that kind of assumption gives, gives a similar result. Um, actually less numerically strong, but okay. And um, I should mention, I mean, you can think of GLN as a degenerate case of UN or kind of a case of UN. So in this result, the UN was assumed to be anisotropic, which is to say that the automorphic forms for it live on a compact quotient. So the whole point of theorem one will be kind of take that proof, generalize it to GLN plus one times GLN where everything's non-compact, and then further take one of them to be an Eisenstein series, which you can imagine, imagine at least at first glance, kind of wrecks analytic havoc on what you're trying to do. So it's, so, so it's a bit similar in spirit to trying to pass from something like a vial law for a compact quotient to a vial law for GLN. We're not trying to prove a vial law, we're trying to average L functions, but it's similar in spirit and like the same, the same, the same kind of difficulties will show up involving unipotent terms and some kind of trace formula like thing. Okay, and with that, I'd like to uh, transition to talking a little bit about kind of the general method that we'll be using. But let's ask real yeah, quick. Sure. Why is T0 minus T harder than T00, or is it not at the same time? Uh, T00 is also hard. It's not the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. maybe, 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 maybe harder. I mean, it's just the only case I want T0. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so theorem, all the uninteresting cases. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe some people like the T aspect. Well, many people. But it's the zero you're scared of. It's exactly the zeros that show up. You know, ask why I'm interested to get rid of Linden stress proof. Yeah. We'll give an effective proof of that and also solve some open questions in that direction, like compacts. It would avoid the um, No, not that question. That's how we envision doing it already. All right. <laughs> All right, so I'm still trying to remember how big these boards are in some sense. Um, all right, we'll see how this one works. So I want to say a couple words about maybe the general method that is used to understand these sorts of things. So um, although, although in the actual paper that I've written, you won't see moments appear explicitly, I think the way you understand it is through the moment method. And I'll just sketch a couple words about that here. So we'll take pi, like on all these blackboards, which is some cuspidal thing on GLN. Um, it'll actually be convenient for reasons you'll see in just a second to bump the index up by one. So for the rest of the talk, our theorem will be about GLN plus one. I'll, I'll show you why in a second. So we'll put that in some family of things that are defined in the same way. Uh, I'll ignore issues involving continuous spectra because this is just a heuristic overview. And then we'll note the following um, trivial inequality that if you want to bound L of pi half to the two nth power. I was you a funny question. Yeah, sure. When did you switch half and pi? When did I switch half and pi? I write L one half pi, you write it. Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> so I get in the habit of my first level of sophistication. Yeah. No, 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 I mean, I mean, well, 
I've kind of, since I started studying the subject, I've always thought of pi as the fundamental thing, and then t is the ancillary thing. Now, now, now that's open for debate, but also, I mean, when I actually work on these things privately, I just write L of pi. <laughs> and, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but, so, but, but L is the habit. Would you write L chi s? I would write L chi s, but if someone argued with me, I would switch it. Because I think I heard that Sarah writes L of s chi, so. So you should uh, rebound. Okay. Show it Okay, but Langlands right tell it. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, if you sum this thing over a family, I'll write, say, pi prime for the element of the family. You can see why, you can maybe see why I changed n to n plus one. I don't know how to pronounce the number 2n minus second or 2n minus first or whatever this exponent would be otherwise. Okay. And so now, um, if you assume the Lindelof hypothesis that we noted on the middle board, you know how big this sum should be. It should be roughly the cardinality of the family. Now, um, let's imagine we choose the family to consist of things of level one and with parameters in quite small windows. For example, if the parameters are spaced out, we could ask them each to lie in an interval of size roughly one. That's quite a small family. You can't really analytically detect things much smaller than that. So for such a family, we know what the vial law um, looks like. So I'll say for a short family, you get roughly t to the n plus one choose two. Okay. And if you take the two nth root of this, this estimate, you get, L of pi half is bounded by, I guess, t to the n plus one over four. So using a trace form. Um, no, I guess we'll use Cauchy Schwartz to be. No, no, how do you even set it up so that you have a family? I'll show you the thing at the top. Okay, you but, expand the kernel or? Yeah, you can think, you you can think of it as expanding trace. a Poincare series. Trace. That's the okay, way. Then take a trace. Yeah. Okay. So under our assumptions that all of the lambda j's are at the same size, this number here is roughly the fourth power of the Archimedean conductor. So what we've done so far is recover the trivial bound. But now if you're kind of used to the subject, you know there's this technique pioneered by Duke Freelander and Urbanich in the 90s called amplification, which effectively shrinks the family by taking into account not just how the Archimedean parameters are positioned, but also how the small prime numbers have their Hecke eigenvalues positioned. And so that, I mean, you're, you really work with weighted families to implement that, meant that precisely, but it has the effect of shrinking the family a bit. So I'll just say, if you take a short family, family and you amplify it, you can make that a bit smaller, then you can make this a bit smaller, and you can make this a bit smaller. That's more or less what the proof will do. And if you've never looked at one of these proofs, that's kind of the way to, to think about it. For instance, you can see from this sketch right away why the particular method that I'll describe here can never apply to one of these examples. Because you've already shrunk the family kind of as, most, as much as you can hopefully do. You need to make delta really, really, really big in order to win there, but the proof won't let you make delta big unless you have some great new idea. Wait, you're gonna amplify with finite places. Yeah, exactly. While in GL2, you don't have to. You, you can just shrink that by shrinking the... Uh, well, think about GL2 and the spectral aspect for MOS forms. So with T, negative T is the two parameters. T, T plus one, yeah. Then you... Then uh, so the that, other way to do that would be to take the fourth power. Exactly, yeah. And then take the long side. Yep, so that's the... Uh, that, that, that's hopefully the future, but... Um, yeah, for the present, we have, we have this limitation for this particular moment. Okay. So now, um, yeah, for the remainder of the talk, I will try to explain like how this is actually implemented. Um, and I mean, the explanation will, will certainly be incomplete in many senses. Um, so in particular, I won't give like a detailed comparison of this paper with the unitary groups paper. I'll just try to kind of say what happens, which um, I guess one of the advantages of working on GLN is even though it's a bit analytically harder, things are a bit more explicit because you have 
things like Whitaker functions that you can use to construct on the rest. Um, you can construct Eisenstein series explicitly. So, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll kind of describe things or reduce them to the basic inputs um, to the extent that we can. Okay, and maybe I'll actually um, put something on this, this board here real quick. So, we need a little bit of notation, and I, and I promise it's not too much, or I hope it's not too much. We're going to start talking about integral representations of automorphic forms, and we'll be referring a lot to the group G, which will be GLN plus one of the reals, and H will be GLN of the reals. And we'll also let gamma denote, I mean, does anyone want to guess? GLN plus one of the integers, and then gamma H will denote uh, GLN of the integers. Also, every now and then, I'll use um, the letters N and A to denote the usual subgroups of G. So N is the, N is the upper triangular unipotent subgroup, and A is the diagonal subgroup. All right, so now I'll try to give a crash course on integral representations of L functions for GLN plus one times GLN following, um, I guess for NAPL2, it's this old work of Hecke and Moss, and then for higher ed, it's Jukai, Pietisti, Shapiro, and Shaleka. So integral representations. So this theory takes as input, well, first we'll need pi as above. So some, some automorphic representation. And I'll think of it kind of classically by passing to the level one vectors as a space with smooth functions on G mod gamma. So it'll form an irreducible representation under G and it'll consist of eigenfunctions for all the finite heck operators. I'll need a similar object that I'll call sigma on H. Satisfying the same assumptions. So now we need to choose a pair of vectors. And this is kind of the beginning of the subtlety of the whole theory. I'll write phi for a vector in pi and psi for a vector in sigma. And what we'll do is we'll form the integral of one of these against the other on the smaller space. So the, the basic output of this identity, which is some kind of unfolding calculation um, resulting from sticking in the Fourier expansion for phi and then manipulating things using Fubini is that this spits out the rankin selberg L function for these two things times uh, a local zeta integral. I'll call z of phi c. Is this a cusp form? They can be cusp forms for now. Well, well, certainly pi will be cuspidal. And I guess that's all that matters. So. So Z of phi C will be the integral of the product of the Whitaker functions of phi C, which I'll call W phi and W C uh, with a tilde to remember that it's defined with respect to the opposite character. So for instance, if this were GL2 containing GL1, psi would be a character of the diagonal geodesic. This would be the standard L function. Maybe phi could be a, uh, a weight vector, in which case this would be a classical Whittaker function, and this would be a Mellon transform of that Whittaker function, which would spit out a product of two gamma factors. Um, but this is, this is kind of the general picture underlying that. No, this is, this is, I think, you don't need to divide by it if you, I mean, oh, okay, so this is the finite part of the L function. So, I'm fine. so my Ls are always Euler products. Like in the first board, just a product over. But the second guy is already convolution, right? Your integral. So this is this is a real integral right here. So I'm, I'm kind of working on I'm working on real groups, G and H. So this is the infinite contribution, and these are all the finite contributions. Oh. Yep. His estimate is meaningless if you put in. Okay. If you, don't, if you put in an Archimedean, right? Okay. Lindelof is true. Okay. So um, yeah, now we're actually going to specialize sigma um, in the direction opposite to what you asked about. 
So we're going to take sigma to be the space of Eisenstein series with parameters uh, given by, so n, n zeros. So I guess Eisenstein series, uh, we, mean, we mean minimal Eisenstein series. So defined with respect to a minimal parabolic for GLN are described by, well, for example, n tuples of complex numbers. And if we normalize it the right way, then this will be L of pi half to the n. And I mean, you can just see this is obviously a natural way to try to bound L of pi half, right? Um, so, well, okay, I mean, this mainly comes out of the work of Bernstein, Reznikov, Michel Venkatesh, um, like 20 years ago or so, that you should try to bound numbers like this by running the optimization problem of choosing vectors V and C so that the left-hand side is not too big. And so this number is not too small. That's, that's kind of the whole game. And the, the subtlety is that, well, I mean, first of all, these are infinite dimensional representations. So you gotta, gotta get, your, get familiar with them in order to even know where to look. And then the other subtlety is we don't know much about how these automorphic forms actually behave and how this quotient looks and things like that. Um, so that's, that, that's the basic idea. So what I'll try to do in the remainder of the talk is say something about how we'll choose the vectors. And this will largely follow uh, what comes up in my paper with Akshay, um, but I'll be able to present it more explicitly than, than normally. And then I'll say, what are the inputs that we need to actually bound things? And then hopefully I'll kind of summarize how we bound them at the end. And we'll see how that goes, but yeah. So you're just explaining basically how to make that lip bluff step unconditional if you yeah thanks i should have i should have mentioned that so yeah this, this this argument assumes lindelof and gives a bound so if you can make that step unconditional as you said then you get a bound anyway yeah thanks okay and before we go on i'm just going to mention one point where i've lied to you a little bit here so of course if you worked with eisenstein series you know that they're analytically a bit of a mess like they grow at the boundary they're not squareable whatever so we'll work instead with pseudo or incomplete Eisenstein series, which are basically what you get by integrating Eisenstein series out in this variable, but the parameters will always be quite close to zero in some sense. And when you make that modification, it has the effect of replacing this nth power with a product of n shifted copies. But I mean, we know in some sense that L values don't vary too much on small enough intervals a precise form of that kind of argument allows us to reduce to the same estimates but with the pseudo things. And I won't stress this much in the rest of the talk. I'll kind of pretend that we can just focus on these. All right, so, so, so step one in this agenda that I advertised is we should choose some vectors, right? So I'll start with the vector um, phi. So this, this is kind of inspired by what shows up in my paper with Akshay, but um, we'll be able to say it a bit more explicitly um, as follows. So how do you describe an automorphic form of phi? I mean, I guess you can describe the representation in terms of its parameters and you know the multiplicity one theorem. And when you think about what that says, it says that you can recover phi from its fourier whittaker expansion. And we're taking everything a full level. So the finite parts in that expansion will just depend upon the Hecke eigenvalues so phi is really determined by its Archimedean Whittaker function. So we just need to say what W phi is, this Archimedean Whittaker function. Now, W phi, so this is a function on G, the bigger of the two general linear groups. Um, there's a standard tool in the theory of Whittaker functions or Whittaker models. Why is it only different? I can still have four expand. I mean, so we're taking it a full level. It's, 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 like, it's like a level one. So I mean, phi, phi of G is like a sum of the Hecke eigenvalue at some diagonal matrix divided by something <laughs> times <laughs> something like that. Is that? Well, okay. no, 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 it, it sounded like you had one Fourier coefficient. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, this is the Archimedean part of the first Fourier coefficient. That, that, yeah. So yeah, yeah, we need to know the lambda n. So so we assume given pi, and of course that's the whole subtlety. 
So the Kirillov model tells us that we can actually determine phi or W phi by its restriction of the subgroup H, which is not an arbitrary function. So it, um, we can think of it as a smooth function on H mod its unipotent subgroup that transforms according to some non-degenerate character of that unipotent subgroup. So in order to kind of think about things in a bit more hands-on way, we can choose a complementary subgroup to NH. So I'll, I'll use the following, I'll write QH for the lower triangular Burrell subgroup, which is the property that um, H is basically NH times QH. This is kind of the open cell in the Bruhat decomposition. So in particular, this contains a neighborhood of the identity and is dense and open in H. So we can then determine W phi by its restriction to QH, which by the theory of the Kirillov model is more or less an arbitrary function. We can just put any function we want there, and then we can trace these steps in reverse and get, get an automorphic form. So now I'm gonna tell you what the function is. And um, yeah, okay. So this function will be a bump on, um, so a matrix that I'll define in just a second that I'll call A T, and we'll take a little neighborhood of that matrix. So one plus big O, um, basically T to the negative half. We'll leave a little more room. So A T, I'll, I'll write explicitly. It's, it's T to the half sum of the positive co roots. If you want an, an intrinsic definition, and it's just the diagonal matrix that looks like this. So I've defined a vector for you. It's not obviously useful. I mean, the, the way you come up with the definition is you stare at the introduction to this paper, and you see what vector it suggests you should take, and then it ends up getting that definition. We will be able to see why this vector is a useful one for this problem. Can you say something about what WPC tilde looks like for your choice of C? You yeah, that's coming on, on this board. Yeah. And the answer is kind of the same thing if you want. Um, if you want to ruin the surprise. Um, okay, so um, construction of C. Um, so very right, similar, but um, I'll put it in quotes because. For those of you that have printed out the paper and are following along in the front row, um, this is not actually how I constructed in the paper. It's uh, for kind of technical reasons related to things I'll talk about later. It's constructed differently. So just don't interpret this as literally what happens. But if you were to do this, you would get something more or less equivalent to what is actually done. And there's, there's one kind of cool feature about um, the Whitaker function for C, which is the following. So, by construction, it's a bump function based at AT. So it's more or less constant on a neighborhood like this, where you allow the variation, so this one plus big O something, to take place in the lower triangular Borel of the general linear group one smaller, so GLN minus one. That's the analogous property. But actually, this property holds um, for all elements of the general linear group lower triangular Borel and GLN. So it holds a bit more robustly than you might expect just from the construction. And this, uh, I'll be able to say in a couple blackboards, like roughly where this comes from. Um, it comes from the fact that we're working with pseudo Eisenstein series of parameters zero, which are co adjoint micro localized on the nil cone. And then this, this ends up being the stabilizer of their micro localizing parameter, if you're familiar with what I mentioned above there. Okay, so, so one consequence of this is that we can, we can estimate this local zeta integral very, very easily. So we remember it's just this integral. So, okay, I should say this is like roughly one maybe. Um, 
is this integral of the product of these two things. So the first one, I mean, I guess we can, we can integrate over QH because that gives a complementary subgroup. The first function is a bump function. The second function is more or less constant on the support of that bump function. So this is an easy integral to evaluate, just kind of the volume of the support. I'll just write the evaluation as T to some explicit power. So if you're familiar with these antecedent works on UN, for those, the construction of the vectors was, was not quite as explicit. And actually the analogous estimate was kind of non-trivial. Whereas here we've cooked things up in such a way that they're non-trivial. That's not an important point for what we're talking about, but just in case you're Okay, so um, now I'd like to take a couple minutes to talk about what bounds we need for the Eisenstein series psi. You say a word, you yeah. can apply a possible some way with some variables. Is it going to be a Plancharel formula to get the L2 norm and some of that? Or? No, it'll basically just be Cauchy Schwartz, if that makes sense. I mean, you, you can think of it as you can think of Parseval and non negativity as a way to prove Cauchy Schwartz. If that makes sense. Um, uh, usually, when it's looking for orthogonal, some orthogonality, so that the O2 norm, you have that's less than or equal to. Uh, but what's really there is there's some L2 norm or something that of this bump function that you're expanding in on the group that's equal to some of the squares here or not? Yeah, so, oh, okay, let me. Um, maybe I can come back to it in like five minutes. If that's because, that, because yeah, I'll, is that okay? Yeah. Um, so I just want to say what we need as far as bounds for C. So remember, C lives on this. Um, so I guess we'll normalize psi so this L2 norm is roughly one. So L2 of H mod gamma H norm. And what we'll need at the end of the argument is a non-trivial bound for the local L2 norms as we go away from the bulk of the fundamental domain. So remember, H1 gamma H is a non-compact quotient. And the way we understand its non-compactness is using a reduction theory following Minkowski and Siegel, which says that every element can be written as a product of two elements that I'll call A and X, where A lives in the diagonal subgroup and is dominant. So this means the entries are uh, decreasing. And X lives in some compact subset of H that you can fix. Okay, and this is a finite to one map. So it gives a reasonable approximation to the fundamental domain. So, what we'll need is the following. I'll call this theorem two. It appears in the same paper. We need a non-trivial bound for the L2 norm of psi over the translate of omega on the left by one of these elements A. Now, what do we mean by non-trivial? So the trivial bound is understood as follows. The Haar measure on this quotient looks something like the Haar measure on H in the variable X, the Haar measure on A, and then you divide by uh, the modulus character for the Borel. That's what all this theory tells us. This ratio here, we know is bounded by one because if we were to integrate this, this expression over all A, that doesn't change too much because omega is, is kind of fat in the A direction and that integral would be roughly the total L2 norm. So what we'll prove is the following kind of modest improvement. Um, we'll take the minimum of the numbers A1 inverse and AN, we'll raise that to the nth power, and then we'll include a little safety thing, T to the epsilon. Okay. So as, so as A tends to infinity in some sense, um, I, I guess the, the case that the determinant of A is roughly one is the only case that really matters here because psi will otherwise be very small. Um, the number a1 will tend to infinity and the number an will tend to zero. So one of these two numbers, well, actually both of them will kind of tend to zero and this will be a non-trivial estimate. Sorry, Paul, the a yeah. there means the image inside gamma h1h. No, I really mean, um, think of this as a subset of h. So 
So, so that map, the, the fibers get bigger. The fibers should be finite. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. They get bigger indeed near the cusp. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. So you're proving something even stronger in a sense. Yeah. I mean, well, well. I mean, if, if you don't want to pay attention to what I've defined, like I'm taking the trivial thing and I'm improving it by, by that. Um, so I don't want to go into the, the proof because this is roughly, I mean, this, well, this, this is a big part of the work. So I just wanted to kind of make, mention the statement. The proof is basically, you look at, um, so here's, here's, a, here's a proof idea. I'll write it on this next board. So the proof idea is you consider expressions like this. So you integrate psi squared over h mod gamma h, and you, you weight the sum by some, uh, you can call them Ziegel theta functions or mirabolic pseudo Eisenstein series, whatever, whatever name you want to attach to sums like this, where you take phi to be a non-negative function. So now you can imagine some of these integrals will bound from above some of these expressions. But on the other hand, this is actually, this is kind of like a rankin selberg integral. I mean, if you, if you were to spectrally expand everything in sight, it would be literally a superposition of rankin selberg integrals. So you can kind of unfold it. You can reduce the local estimates. You can actually estimate, carry them out. And you'll get one of the two bounds that I wrote there. And you need one further trick, which is you can exploit the outer automorphism of GLN to pass from one bound to the other. So, so both of these are kind of really needed to get this minimum here, and the minimum is absolutely needed for the for the proof. And what is the so, input about the rankin selberg L function you use? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, nothing. I don't use any. I, I mean, the rankin selberg L function for psi will just be zeta function near one, as it turns out, or products of zeta near one. Oh, oh I see. I see. But, but I don't use those anyway. I, I don't because I, I don't spectrally expand. I just do kind of a physical unfolding, which, which turns out to work eventually. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's right. And um, so, so you might wonder about the input. So the input is that Eisenstein series satisfies spectral gap. So um, we're in good shape there. Okay. Um, so I want to mention maybe in just a couple minutes the. Uh, the main inputs concerning phi that we'll use. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll title this section um, Symmetries of Phi. So, by symmetries of phi, I mean roughly elements of the group that when you act on phi by them, they map it to something roughly like a multiple of itself. And we want to understand. What part of the group does that? So this is, this is a question, since it'll involve elements kind of near the identity, we can think about it in terms of Lie theory. Uh, the eigenvalues for an action of a Lie algebra are described by the dual Lie algebra. So the symmetries will be described by a particular element that I'll describe now. And for describing it, I'll use the trace pairing to think about the right-hand side as a space of matrices. So the element that, that's relevant is an element I'll call tau. And it's the unique element in this dual space that first of all has the following form. So it should be aside from the rightmost column, something like this. And then the rightmost column consists of some unknown coefficients. But we pin it down uniquely by asking that the eigenvalues of this matrix be roughly uh, the numbers that show up in the functional equation, for instance. So this is a condition that you can also rephrase in terms of the infinitesimal central character of the representation. Um, or um, if, if, if the representation were assumed to be tempered, you could express this as saying that tau lies in the cohesion orbit of the representation um, after multiplying by t. Ways you can view this condition. And this is the matrix that comes up. And I'll just say what we need 
So I'll, I'll say a couple of theorems that maybe give an impression about how this matrix controls the vector phi. So for one, Lie algebra elements, phi is an approximate eigenvector. And the eigenvalue is described by this matrix tau. Okay. And I mean, the error is quite strong in some sense. So if we, if we think about things, if, if we define big O of one to mean things that look like phi, then it's quite a bit smaller. So this is T, this is T to the half. Um, th th this all just mentioned is, is kind of a, a lengthy part of the paper as well. Um, it's kind of easy to understand this when X lies in the Lie algebra of the Mirabolic subgroup, because that acts very explicitly on the Whitaker model. And the standard thing in the, sub, in the subject when you think about Whitaker functions is trying to understand all the whole group X. So we end up using um, the known action of the center of the universal developing algebra together with something called um, a, 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 a Capelli determinant that gives an explicit construction of the generators of that, which is kind of like a, a non-commutative determinant formed out of elements of the Lie algebra. We can expand it in kind of non-commutative minors and eventually invert that expansion to relate the action of the Mirabolic, the known action of the center of the universal enveloping algebra to determine the full action and fill in what these C1 through C4 should be. So just to give a few words about it, that's kind of what goes into that. That's part three of the paper. Um, so the, the thing we need to kind of um, connect that to the main theorem is an integral operator version of the same theorem. So it'll involve a function that I'll call omega, which will be basically the characteristic function of a, of a set called J, that I'll define in a second. We'll smoothen it out, and we'll multiply it by a function of chi and divide by the volume of J. We're here, the matrix J, sorry, the, the set J will consist of group elements that are kind of a bit small, so kind of a little bit close to the identity, and quite nearly preserve the matrix tau under the coadjoint action. And then the function chi will be given on exponentials by basically tau, so e to the negative i t x. Well, that notation, um, theorem four, which I'll just put here, says that the integral operator attached to omega very, ne very nearly preserves phi. So kind of in the strongest possible sense, it reproduces it. And, and the feature to pay attention here to is that something like this theorem four would follow quite easily if we restricted G to be within roughly T to the negative half of the identity. We've done something much weaker here. We've only required it to be within roughly t to the negative half of the centralizer group tau. And so there's a further argument using the center of the universal enveloping algebra and this microlocal calculus that comes up in my paper with Akshay and also my paper on unitary groups that um, roughly speaking takes the following picture of the Fourier support of phi, which you can think of as initially being some window of this shape. Using the known action of the center of the universal enveloping algebra, which kind of constrains it to this uh, orbit O pi. And then we basically fill in a little rectangle here that contains the intersection of those two. And the rectangle can be taken to have width roughly t to the epsilon. You take that rectangle, take its Fourier transform, you'll get basically the function omega. And so that gives you the preservation. That's more or less how the proof goes. Okay, so now in the final minutes, I'll say something about how these inputs combine to give a proof of the main bound. Um, yeah, I apologize for just saying very quick sentences about these parts. Um, someone mentioned to me that I could give more talks about some of the details if people are interested. But okay. <laughs> well, uh, we accept. Yeah. Good idea would be just to explain what you're doing in that part. <laughs> <laughs> See how different it is to all the standards. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, 
Hey, we'll try to wrap things up now. So um, let's start with the basic identity we started with. So we had an integral over h mod gamma h over a cusp form phi, our Eisenstein series psi. Let's square that because we're about to apply Cauchy Schwartz. And then let's write down the basic output of the Jacquin company theory, which is that you get the 2 nth power here times some localization integral that we understand squared. And now let's use theorem 4 here to stick in pi of omega. And this identity will still be kind of approximately valid. So we're in good position now. Um, okay, well, we'll actually we'll add in a heck operator to the definition of omega as well. That kind of does the further amplification. Um, and we will. So wait a minute, just before, yeah. before you start to amplify. Yeah. You, you will get the event block on average. Yeah. Just from this argument. And it's so you're going to this squared is that. You sort of have this uh, the fact that you fix and you have this action which is fixing is kind of a, a it kind of defines the family in some sense. Yeah. Like the family consists of all pi for which this operator is non negligible. That's the, that's the way you think of the family from this perspective. Um, so yeah, I mean we'll put we'll put phi in a Hilbert space, something like L2 of G mod gamma with respect to the central character. Pi. So now we're maybe normalized phi to the unit vector. So we can apply Cauchy Schwartz painlessly. And um, we will get an integral. This is also the same thing you get if you apply something like a relative trace formula. But I mean, it's just another way to think of it. So here's the expression you get. So you'll get a sum over elements of, I'll say P gamma for gamma mod the center. Um, I'll write omega sharp for kind of a mild modification of omega. So it satisfies the same support conditions, but um, um, I mean, I guess omega is explicitly you take, omega sharp is you take omega, involve it with its dual, and then average over the center against eta pi. That'll give you this kind of thing. Okay, um, so I think I have like four minutes left, but maybe I'll just try to um, end a little early and then explain more according to questions. Um, so what we'll basically do here is, so we'll apply the triangle inequality to everything in sight. So um, to both integrals and the sum. We'll study this sum um, or this, this this double integral using Ziegel domains. So we'll have variables, let's say ax and by, where a and b are diagonal elements, and x and y lie in some fixed compact set omega. So then this whole thing will be bounded by an integral over, yeah, so a and b will be dominant diagonal matrices. Well, the sum over p gamma. Integral over x and y and omega, absolute value of everything. All right. Yeah. You're summing up a discrete group here. What's capital H there? It's gamma H, I understand. So I'm taking what? gamma by the center. It's like cosets, no, just on the left. Are we integrating our this fundamental domain? Integral this over a fundamental domain for H is. So you're asking what is H? Or I, there's a, you're now summing. Yeah, this is a sum over gamma in, um, I mean, explicitly, this is PGL n plus one of set. Okay, H1 and H2 are integrated. Now you're breaking it up into the domains. Yeah. And so um, there's a subset here consisting of the elements of H that gives rise to some kind of main term. So I'll write MT for that. So subtracting this off, we'll get this plus some kind of main term as um, the conclusion of our analysis. And um, so what we get from this, I'll write implies star, and then I'll just briefly say the input for star in maybe the closing minute. 
we get that L of pi half 2n divided by the thing we expect, the family size, is bounded by, so there's a main term that will amplify away, that'll give t to the negative delta. Um, we'll have a small savings here, t to the negative quarter, plus some losing from the length of the amplifier, that I'll call t to the c delta, times the following integral i. So i is just the integral over dominant diagonal matrices a, as before, you can take the determinant of A to be roughly one. Um, so you'll take, it'll be a familiar object now, the L2 norm of psi on A omega. And then what you get is the product over J going from one to N of the maximums of AJ and AJ inverse uh, times the usual measure DA over modulus function evaluated A. So this expression here is bounded by the maximum of A1, I mean, up to some small error maybe, A1 and An inverse to the N. So this whole integral I is bounded by T of the epsilon thanks to theorem two, this growth bound for Eisenstein series that we mentioned earlier in the talk. This, this will be T to the epsilon. And so we'll be in good shape to win by choosing delta small enough. This is kind of the signature of the amplification method that you get bound of that shape. So I just need to say a word about the input to star. Okay, the, yeah. the L2 statement before you amplify. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to really talk about amplification there. It's supposed to just be that these things just cover the domains independently somehow. Uh, there's no estimate that you're really doing other than making bump functions and looking at oscillator integrals. I mean, what's the input? Yeah, there's no, well, I'll, I'll give you the input here. I mean, this, this will be inputs for star. So inputs for star. So what we'll do is we'll treat the integral over x and y and omega as some kind of like bilinear form in the tube size. So I'll, I'll describe that in a second. Then we do elementary counting of matrices. The counting will give rise to this factor product of maximums. And then we'll basically be left with this expression here, which we'll treat using the growth bound that I mentioned earlier. So, so the, main, the main point that it may raise to explain is just this bilinear forms thing. So we'll use, um, we we'll use the fact that the spectral rate will morally use the fact that the spectral radius of a matrix is the maximum of the rosoms. Um, the matrix is non negative entries. Um, we'll, use, we'll use the invariance, kind of the approximate invariance of psi under central elements. We'll use the fact that. Let's say usually conjugated element A inverse gamma B is not even approximately contained in the subgroup H because we've taken out the ones where it is in and discrete, discreteness would force if A and B are one, it to never be in, not even approximately. Most of the time, this is kind of what happens. And then finally, um, we need one, one final lemon linear algebra, which I'll just state. It's kind of there's a Lie theory problem that emerges from all of this when you take these inputs and optimize things. That Lie theory problem you can reduce to a Lie algebra problem. And, it's, and it ends up being a kind of pleasant linear algebra problem. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of state it on this last board and then that'll be the end of the talk. So the lemma is the following. So I'll take any element tau. You take the tau like in this talk, that's a, that's a good example. I'll write it in block diagonal form like so where tau zero will be a matrix of dimension one lower, the upper left block. I'll assume, and this comes back to this conductor dropping thing again, that none of the eigenvalues of tau are also eigenvalues of tau zero. So this should be the empty set. We'll let um, be an element of the Lie algebra centralizer of tau that doesn't lie in the center. 
let Z be a basis element for the center of H. What we need to know is that then a certain iterated commutator does not lie in um, some space of commutators. So I could I, I could draw a picture with a little more time to kind of maybe indicate a bit more precisely how this connects to what we're talking about. Um, but okay, yeah, I, I, I guess I'll end now because um, the time's up. But um, yeah, I'd be happy to kind of go into more detail on any of the three or four points that I didn't really explain here. Um, but yeah, otherwise, thanks very much for uh, coming and your questions and all that. Somebody else can ask question. I have a question that maybe what Peter was asking, I'm not quite sure, but I, I'm, I'm wondering when you're doing the actual um, averaging, like at some point you're summing over your, your forms, right? You have a family, you use that family to get some sum. Yeah, it's, it's implicitly carried out in this application. Of course, yeah, right here. Yeah, that's the so idea. Is, like a simple minded way that I have of thinking about it, are you essentially expanding psi in the, in the, the basis of the cusp forms? And you're writing the algorithm ah. side in that way, and you're sort of picking out the guys you, you want, or which would be just a Cauchy Schwartz kind of inequality, or are you doing something, I don't know, different, more clever? I think I'm not doing anything very clever. Uh, I, 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 I mean, the way I would describe it is you think of phi as living in this space, and then you construct a Poincare series using this expression. You do a little unfolding to but write this integral as an inner product of phi yeah. against something else. At what point do you sum over your different members of what you're called script capital F? Like, where is that sum being carried out? So, if so, so my favorite way to prove the Cauchy Schwartz inequality is to pretend that one vector is the basis vector E1. And then you take the, the norm of the second vector in terms of the that standard basis. So, if you think about that proof of the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, where you take as your basis um, all the different fees in all the different pies, then that proof of Cauchy Schwartz basically expresses this as like a moment over a family that you then drop all the one term of. It's the way, you, yeah. Okay. What we trying to, what I'm trying to understand is yep. there's no cancellation here. So you got square, then you're just counting the number, this elementary count that you swept over. Is that tricky or is it trivial? So the, uh, the number of elements in that sum, which are lying in different regions. So sometimes that could be. But yeah, so I thought you're just bounding that by discounting. So, so you should think it. So, a good analogy would be I mean, you know, your paper with Ivania, Sean, L infinity norms. Yeah. So, you know, kind of the inputs that would be needed there in order to get any non trivial bound, not the best possible. So, the one input you need is that we know how to count intervals and integers. There's, we know how to count how many integers there's there in an interval. That's the one. It's always global infinity. And, and you're not needing more here. No. Yeah. So, the L2 norm statement is completely soft. Sounds about. Other than stationary phase and bump function. The amplification, of course, is going to be a whole. Well, you have to input something there, I'm sure. Yeah, you input the um, the <laughs> spectral gap from psi, which is an Eisenstein series. So, um, yeah, you absolutely use a bound towards your Ramanujan from psi. You need, you need anything better than one half. At all the finite places. Yeah. Which. Is but the L. Uh, so I used to call this uh, maybe pregnant to deliver, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when the L2 bound gives you back your complexity and you just need to do this little extra, that's supposed to be soft. And it is soft, right? Uh, you're not using any, it's just, uh, yeah. it's, it's like a large silk kind of inequality. I mean, if you were working with a compact quotient, you could even choose your test functions in such a way yeah, the hard part vanishes identically. Right, you kill all, all like, the time. Yeah, okay. so, so, I mean, it's this hard part that, you know, eventually reduces to this kind of thing, this yeah. linear algebra thing. So, it's, it's, uh, you've set it up right. You've got the right uh, patterning. Yeah. Oh, another question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, just to understand again, if you, if you look at these regions where the conductor is, uh, we have like these zeros, you have the zeros showing up. For your lambdas, we are doing the parameters uh, for your pi. Okay, you want one of them to be small. Yeah, for yeah, example. Good. Yeah. So um, the it's up when using the size of this family, right? Like, because you're averaging over, you want to know how many guys there are and stuff. 
Yeah. Um, the, that's some sort of file law type thing happening there. That can understand the difference if one of the lambdas drops to zero, right? No, no, so, so, so the spectral letters, it doesn't change at all if one of the lambdas drops to zero. That's, I see. Yeah. That's how you take a look at it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it'll change if they collide, but the way we normalize it, we actually get families that stay the same size even when they do collide. So the connector dropping is just not detected by, by this by this kind of approach. Yeah. I mean, even for GL2, this kind of approach does not work for the conductor dropping case. So there's one thing left to try. Oh, well, there's a family of things left to try, which is try doing higher moments somehow. Um, yeah. And hopefully we'll reduce to this, but maybe we'll reduce to something else. I don't know. We'll see. Should be interesting. I'd like, by the way, someone to convince me that this has a like an easy solution, this little linear algebra problem here. I've kind of mentioned it in the various talks I've given on this thing. Is this the kind of thing you could imagine like assigning to undergrads on their midterms as bonus questions? And maybe one of them would come up with a better way to do it than I did. Um, I mean, for a simple statement, my proof is a little more complicated than one would hope, but. Um, One thing, uh, let's see if we can encourage people to ask a question because we've not let everybody from the university come here, which I'm not happy about. Anybody got a question? <laughs> Manju. Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> or you just pretend? Yeah, I You're putting me on the spot, man. <laughs> no, great talk, Paul. Thanks. <laughs> no question. <laughs> uh, this is a bit of a problem in long term with this with the seminar. How are we going to deal with it? So it would be good if this actually works. So we have to somehow get the, if we're not going to let people come here, we must allow them to. We have to get worse speakers, so there's things to ask questions about. <laughs> I can give worse talks, actually. <laughs> <laughs>